And uh, Nicole, without ado, we'll call the first item. Our first application this evening is continued from May 16, 2013. Christine and Joe Donnelly of Montreal Road, the best of the current findings. The MGL Tech 48 section 6 to extend and increase the season from 9 to 7. Okay, uh, on, on this, Michael, I'm, yes. uh, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, just for the record. For the record, Michael Hayes for the Donnellys, and Mrs. Donnelly is here tonight. Her husband is uh, back at sea, so. Well, this is Donnelly. Uh, safe travels for him. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, I wanna, I'm gonna cut, you, I'm gonna make your job easy tonight. Okay. Um, because, okay. because in the ensuing month, uh, you were kind enough to forward us the Gale case, which, um, uh, and the uh, the Copeland and Page memo, which I guess didn't come to us, but in in any event, I I, I owe I would like to apologize to your client because uh, the Gale case was a January 2012 appeals court case, which we should have known about. I didn't know about it until that month. Well, it's That's your fault then. It's my fault. <laughs> I'll take the blame. Okay, um, and um, for those who. Um, haven't uh, had the chance. I, I, I don't want to presume that um, that um, everybody has had a chance to review it. But the Gale case was an appeals court case, which essentially told tells us that what we have been doing, we and and other uh, every almost every other zoning board in the state have been doing for the past several years is wrong. Actually, what they they just changed the rule, and what what the Gale case basically says is that. The rule that we and other zoning boards have been operating under, which essentially is that um, if a new nonconformity is created, um, we must apply the variance standard to a new nonconformity. Um, we do not have to apply the variance standard to a new, new nonconformity. And that uh, when, so, and, and, and the upshot is that when you are, create, when you are altering a nonconforming structure or use, if you create a new nonconformity, it is regarded under the same standard of, of um, not substantially more detrimental, um, notwithstanding the fact that it's a new nonconformity. Absent, of, uh, even, even in, and the thing that's interesting about that case is that the zoning bylaw apparently says otherwise and, 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 and uh, it says we will treat new nonconformities differently. Variance. Right. It's a variance, right. Yeah. And so our bylaw is even silent on that, and the fact that theirs is not that I think that the appeals court had made a mistake, but the SJC didn't. Um, used to review. Right. Yeah. So uh, the current law is that uh, we do not require uh, that um, the Donnelly's uh, meet a variance standard uh, to approve um, the side porch. porch. And right. I guess one thing I could just tell you again, to, to, to be brief as well, is that uh, two things also occurred since our last meeting. Number one, in your file, uh, Mrs. Donnelly went around to all of her neighbors. Saw that. And uh, her neighborhood is unanimous in support of the project. Uh, the other thing that I discussed with the Donnellys, uh, Sarah, to your concerns regarding the closeness of that garage, that abutting garage and, and some uh, the Donnellys are uh, willing to have it uh, to to make that corner of the house the house not the porch the house that corner on the uh, yacht club side uh, to put in uh, the two hour fire protection um, uh, wall board to put, to uh, to protect. Uh, in case of fire and that type of stuff, and they are certainly willing to do that. I think they would have to anyway, wouldn't they? I mean, to get the permit? Yes. yes. I don't know, but they're, they're certainly willing to do it. Any <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, with the clarification of uh, the current law, uh, does anybody have any further questions or comments or concerns uh, carried forward from the last week? Well, Sarah. Don't, don't we still have the problem that that covered porch to the north, I think it's the north, is an illegal structure? But we are a, we're in a position where we can permit it. 
You're in a position where you can make it legal. It is illegal, and that's why we are. Everything we've done is actually to your benefit long term. Um, but um, but the, it can be included in this application. The, if if uh, if the if it did, it, it, even though it's illegal, if we asked them to tear it down and they came in and asked for the other expansions or alterations that included a new uh, roof, we would treat that request under the Section 6 standard not requiring a variance. That's the point. And make a determination as to how you increase, or how the proposal increases the non-conforming nature, and then make a decision whether or not the group feels it's substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. What we could do, actually, to address that technicality is that we could say, on the condition that the old roof, illegal roof, is destroyed, uh, we will, uh, we could grant the special permit to replace it. No. Oh, that's not it. I don't have it either. I don't know. I don't know. I have it. It's behind that letter uh, of approval that I think is in your part of your file. I think he was a little flat plan. Well, I have it here too. Thank you for the plan. Yes. Okay. I mean, I'm not voting on it anyway. I really haven't changed my position. I think that that should be a pergolet, you know slatted over it um, but I've been through that last week and I don't have a vote so uh, <clears throat> that, that's that's John Malone's signature it is yes right. and he's the affected of butter he's the affected of butter because okay. on that side yes I recognize that signature it used to be on everybody's check oh is that right <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah that makes sense <coughs> Uh, okay, uh, now, Sarah, when you say you're not voting on it, were you? Not, were you I was not here the first okay. time, first right. meeting, so I don't. So, I can't vote. So who are the three members? John, Ed, and me. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, any other uh, questions, comments, concerns? Just one question. I point is, I think we just need a. We don't actually have the physical distance. On the um, on the other side of the property, on the plans, we have it from the house, but not the roof. Okay. So that we think it's close enough. Number at some point we probably need. And we can scale it off and approximate now, but if we could. Well, we can get that and make that part of it and file it. Uh, uh, yeah, meeting. and I, I guess I would have one other comment. If you, it, it sounds like you guys are going to approve it, just to condition it that the the covered porch cannot be enclosed at any time in the future. Uh, do you have a response to that? Just as a, as a. Well, I, I know the the Donnies had no intent to enclose it. That so was not part of the. Okay, so the condition wouldn't. No. Okay. Um, I wonder if that, uh, if we approve the roof as part of the structure, would that becomes a drip edge? Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else? I think it's it's appropriate in the finding um, special permit we can stipulate that the uh, covered deck to the um, northeast side the <coughs> covered porch is not uh, in the future to be converted to living space, to living space um, or as a foundation for a second floor along that line. <coughs> if some new owners in the future comes before the board at least that will be on record as being our intent. That works for you? Yes. The other thing Mike, is the um, 
the plan that we have dated 32713 um, has an uh, incorrect statement in the existing rear yard setback that says it's 39 feet. It's actually probably more like 27. 39 was a transposition of the lot width. Just a housekeeping issue. It's 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 in the zoning table, which is a courtesy as opposed to a. Oh 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 yes. Component. No up here you just think. Yeah. It says under required, it says 20 feet existing, it says 39 feet, which I think is actually citing the lot width, not the yeah. rear yard setback. Okay. Yes, we, we, we can we can have yeah. the plan then for that. So if, if that could be amended and the dimension, uh, the side yard setback on the northeast side as, as proposed could be dimensioned on the plan, that would satisfy my concerns. Good thing Mr. Morris is here. <coughs> Anything else? We'll make a motion, Ed. Uh, oh, actually, I should say, and, and also to draw in that there is a porch. The porch is going to be wrapped around. The, the roof is going to be wrapped around. It currently only shows the yes. porch going. Where it says the deck porch is side to be side. Labeled. Yeah, farmer's porch should be shown to include that corner and the the roof that exists over the deck that was not shown in the drawing. Um, move to grant the special permit slash finding under is this yours? under uh, chapter forty eight section six that the addition of the final porch on the northwest and northeast side of the property as drawn on the Morse plan as amended is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. In other words, meets the special yes. permit conditions specified in the bylaw. <coughs> Got it? Okay. Second. Discussion. Um, I just, uh, I, I, uh, I uh, kind of share, uh, I understand what Sarah's uh, continued reluctance is, but uh, given the fact that the appeals court now says that our uh, consideration of that aspect of the plan is, uh, must be in regard to the substantial detriment standard. Um, I agree that um, the addition uh, as proposed is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. And I also think that it's a, uh, uh, it's a beneficial thing to the immediate abutter and the neighborhood that an illegal uh, shed porch is made um, legal um, by uh, the granting of this application. Uh, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Are you writing that on my? I'll write it. Thank you. 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 Thank Okay. I have to disclose that I work with, with uh, Mr. Morse's mother. <laughs> uh oh. Do you object? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Uh, for the record, my name is Gregory Morse. I'm a registered engineer. I'm representing myself and my wife at our property to my free garden road. We'd like to put an addition on the property. It's located in the R3 zoning district. Shown on the plan here, our property line is in bold. We have Hadley Road to the north, and our frontage has on Garden Road to the east. A residential abutters all the way around the site. Diagonally across here is Dad's convenience store on Hadley Road. The reason why we're before you is 
Um, we want to increase our floor area more than 20% and we're a pre-existing non-conforming structure. The house itself was built in 1925. Um, it's non-conforming with respect to the front yard, setback to Garden Road. It's currently setback 15.1 feet. The bylaw requires 30. It's also non-conforming with respect to the side yard setback. Right now it exists at 7.1 feet. The bylaw requires 8 feet as a setback. The lot itself is fully compliant. It's simply the structure that isn't the lot. It's 15,000 square feet. We have the requisite 100 feet of frontage on Garden Road, the requisite 150 off of Haverly Road itself. The addition, which is highlighted here in yellow, is approximately 30 by 30. Um, it will be a two-story addition, and it increases our floor area a total of 107 uh, percent. In order to, for this board to make a finding, the board needs to essentially determine three things. They need to verify that the existing structure is non-conforming, which I've just outlined with respect to the front and side setbacks. The board needs to make a determination that we're not increasing the non-conformities. The proposed location here complies with all of the setbacks. We comply with the eight-foot setback to the side yard. We comply with 71 feet off of the other side yard and we're well off the side of the 30-foot setback off of Hadley and Garden. So we're not increasing any of the non-conformities. And lastly, the board needs to make a determination that this project will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. We feel that the board can make that determination because all the dimensional requirements are met for the zoning district. Uh, development of a single family home is allowed in the R3 zoning district. And in its entirety, when the project is done, the house will be just under 3,000 square feet in total, which is typical of a size um, on a lot. And we feel that the lot can support that size house. So I'd turn it over to the board for any questions or comments. Anyone have a question or comment? Yes, uh, my name is Sean Rogers. I live at 11 Garden Road. I'm here representing uh, one of the Brave's neighbors. Um, I don't see this being, being a detriment to the neighborhood. I um, don't have any problems with it. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience or otherwise? Okay. Um, I think this is pretty straightforward. I, I love the lines of this house. It's, yeah, it's a, thanks. Pretty. We're working to try to keep. I don't. Kind of bungalows. I don't envy you uh, having to uh, paint the styles of the porch railings. So. Okay. Um, anything further? Uh, Ed, you want to make a motion? Move to grant the special permit to allow the addition of approximately 107 uh, percent increased floor area uh, in accordance with bylaw section 810.2 B as described in the plan, dated 429 13. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? There you go. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Would that they were all so easy. I know. <laughs> Who's up on this one? Um, that is going to be Ed's. So that was mine? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Is that a little pressure, given, given your relationship? I just tell his mother, right? Now. <laughs> you, you bring it to work. Julie? Oh, sorry. That's all right. She can, she's got to set up anyway. Take your time. Um, third application of Julie Johnson, 260 South River Street, Marshfield, requesting the general check 48, section 6, special permit findings to raise and reconstruct a pre existing non conforming single family dwelling, resulting in a greater than 20% Okay, but while Julie is setting up here, I, I just want to ask a procedural question here. Um, 
it should not it, even in the case where the applicant has an agent presenting on her behalf should not the applicant's name be the property owner and the person to derive the benefit of the permit that we're granting although it says if not the owner um, attach a letter of authorization. Letter of authorization so the applicant is actually the person who's yeah I mean I, I guess making I'm, the application I, I, I I'm not quibbling with the accuracy of the application form itself I'm just wondering I mean I you know I've, what have I I've been here eight years I suppose it, if this is the first time I've noticed it well, shame circumstances, on me well circumstances are um, we may have a property under um, agreement for sale right and the owner would not be the one making the application the, per, the potential buyer would be the one making the application well so the, the liability the responsibility for preparing the case would all go to the applicant, applicant not right. the owner in that case. But since the applicant doesn't own the property and the, the special permit has to be recorded before the property passes to the uh, to the buyer, wouldn't uh, wouldn't the I'm curious, Michael. Yes, I, I wasn't my, 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 my question was, and I, you know, this is just taking another 10 minutes out of the first period. Um, <laughs> um, I ask the, uh, uh, after eight years of not asking the question, if, it, if the applicant for the permit shouldn't be the property owner, even if the owner's being represented by an agent, and Ed raises the point, well, if, if, the, if, the, if the applicant is the putative buyer under a, under a purchase and sale agreement um, and we're granting the relief actually the relief goes to the property on the on a variance but it goes to the owner on the special permit so so wouldn't uh, wouldn't the wouldn't the record owner of the property be the appropriate applicant for purposes of keeping the chain of title clear wouldn't the special well, permit go with the property too a, a, a contract purchaser under a purchase and sale agreement, uh, if they are given authority to represent the owner's interest in front of any board, can well, do so. Yeah, yeah. However, I mean, if, if, if it was something that I was involved in, I would not recommend that the buyer purchase the property before the special permit appeal period is passed and the, in, in, in the special permit is recorded at the registry. Well, it's recorded on the property, so I guess uh, so. All right, so it's really not important. Right. Okay, never mind. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, in this particular case, I filled in as the applicant, as I have before for people that sometimes live out of state during the winter months. So when we're preparing the information for the hearing, I'm the point person here in situate that's talking to Neil and to Nicole and setting this up. So that was the only reason I had put it that way. No, it's really not a problem. I'm just being mischievous. Not like you could go sell the special permit on the corner. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Wait till we get it first. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, well, I'm Julie Johnson with Custom Home Designs, and I'm here to represent the homeowner at 92, uh, 92 Marion Road, uh, Fred Vera, Vera Street. Uh, I'm going to be talking it's a typical uh, beach lot. I think you all have a, a plot plan here. I have to, I had another copy end up on my desk here. Did you change it? Was there a modification made or at least identical? I, I wasn't sure if I gave it. Oh, okay. So I left another one. Yeah, okay. I don't think there's a change. All right. Um, it's one of the typical beach lots. They're, um, <coughs> it's uh, about 4750 square feet. It's 50 by 95 as typical for that ocean side area. Um, the existing home was built in 1935 or thereabouts. And if um, you look at some of the photos that we included in the application, it's probably not been added on to or embellished or repaired since 1935 and, and has uh, seen its day. So its condition is very, very poor. Um, the current homeowner feels that the repair cost, uh, renovation cost, to bring it up to building code and to compliance would really be unreasonable. And to boot, the existing uh, house footprint, which is here in orange, is just outside the uh, front setback of 30 feet at 28.5. Um, the rest of the existing house goes up. It's slants out of conformity on the, or just into conformity on the right side setback. Um, but what we'd like to propose is 
The reason why here is erase and reconstruct and rebuild well within those zoning setbacks and be able to build a house that's to today's uh, building codes and as well as the zoning. So we would offer a 31 foot setback from the front, nine feet on the sides, and 24 in the back where it's required 20. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Questions from the board? I have one question. I was a little, um, the nature of the project, you said single family home with accessory dwelling? Well, it's something um, we'd like to consider as we redesign the house to have that option. So if this is approved, actually we have to take one step before another. So if the footprint is approved and we get into the design, obviously it's gonna have to conform to the height and uh, all of those zoning issues. Um, we bring it before the planning board to see if they would approve it as well for a, an accessory dwelling. I just thought it was worth mentioning in this application. Yeah, this yeah. no, it threw me for a loop because I wasn't mm -hmm. sure what you were where you, where you were headed with that for us. Yeah. Yes, you have to write that $7,500 check to the planning board before you can get the accessory <laughs> dwelling. Right, Ed? <laughs> okay. All right, so just for, for clarity, we are not being asked to approve the no. accessory dwelling. No. All right. So, clarify, and I, uh, I may have misunderstood, but I thought you said the rear line was proposed at 24, but it's 21. Um, no, nope, the um, proposed is 24 feet even. On oh. the plan, it's oh, you know what 21. That is the, um, maybe that was the change. Yeah, looks like there is a change. But, and the other, uh, the, the other one's Yep, they're both the same. Are you on town sewer at the property? Yes. Okay, so the, that is the, the cesspool that they've listed is an older? Yeah, that's an older one. Is it the same? That's the same. No, 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 hold it. 20, 24, 21, 24. Okay. okay. We, we okay. Yes. Got it. I'm sorry. Are there two different plants? Yes. There are. We reduced the size of that footprint. Okay. To 40 instead of 43, so this one There we go. They're, they're dated the same, and there's no revision. So we got to make sure we're working on that. Julie, am I am I assu to assume that this isn't your final design shape? It, you you just want to know that you can make it as big as this? Um, it will it'll probably be to that shape. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll try, we're going to try and stay to that that shape um, all bearing um, there will be some exit stairs you know second egress stairs maybe from a deck on the second floor but that would be the um, foundation size plus you. the existing garage which obviously is not part <laughs> of this application but um, it's They'd like to keep it. Currently a two-car garage, and you're going to have a single yeah, foot sideline to get to it, and only maybe three feet in front of the second garage door. So uh, there's actually we'll have about six feet between the two structures with this footprint that's feet. shown yet. No, but, the, um, but it wouldn't be for driving, and it'll be for kayak storage, uh, summer furniture storage, things like that. And you can see the condition of it. It's Probably not had a car in it for many, many years. No one puts cars in cars in garages. Yeah. yeah. You ask my husband, they're not. We put our most expensive things yeah. out on the street and we put our junk in the garage. That's right. <clears throat> okay. Part of me would like to suggest taking the garage down only in, this, in as much as it is right on the lot line, etc., cetera, um, as part of the application, but where in all respects you are within the, the setbacks. You can't do anything about the size of the lot. No. Um, the lot's consistent in size with the neighborhood lot and others on the street, I imagine. Um, it is. Just it's, from experience. You can kind of see the, right. they're all pretty much the same as it goes across and across the street's the same as well. well I'm, although I'm not, uh, I'm not going to pursue that concept of removing the garage. That would get us into a discussion if we can. 
public dollars. <laughs> Suggest. Strongly. Like the IRS. Mm. Okay. If you, came in with a, if, you, if, if you came in with an accessory dwelling application, I might suggest it. Oh, that would be a whole different yeah. conversation. We'd have that. Uh, we'd be that down to negotiating right. between four and five That's feet. Right. There you go. <laughs> okay. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to uh, express an opinion on this? All right. Anything further from the board? Uh, does someone want to make a motion? Ed? Move to grant the special permit to raise and reconstruct a single family dwelling. In accordance with the plan dated May 8th, as revised, indicating the rear yard setback as 24 feet proposed. In the building envelope at 40 feet, right? The building, yeah, the building itself of 40 by 32, right? Are you going to want us to write a decision, or, or uh, are you going to do it? Oh no! <laughs> 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 uh, I think our our uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll make the finding um, that, uh, that the requirements of section six are met, and we'll. The drafter of the decision will do what's done in conformity with our past practice. Past practice. Uh, motion <coughs> then made. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? <coughs> Aye. Opposed? There you have it. Thank you very much. That one is yours to write, but I think because it's your last meeting, somebody else or you're almost done somebody else. I'll volunteer. Okay. Can you just say wow. the last one? That would just one? be cruel to do I'll, that. I'll do, I'll do these two. It should be cruel to the applicant. I'll take one. It's cruel to do that to you. Huh? As Quite much awesome. as we'd all enjoy that. I, I, have, <laughs> I have the boiler plate on both of these. Okay. Okay. Get them off pretty quick. All right. Who, I'm sorry. Who's the second in that one? Oh, anyway, I think it was John. Now, this is fourth fun. and final application this evening is Stephen Bajorklin, trustee of 15 Captain Daniel Litchfield Lane, to request a finding pursuant to MGL Chapter 48, Section 6, and a floodplain special permit pursuant to Section 470.9 of the City of Zoning Bylaw as we have released the board finds necessary to allow the construction of a pre existing, non conforming single family dwelling that will meet all seven requirements non-conforming lot located at Okay. Um, for the record. For the record, Attorney Michael Hayes, I represent uh, Mr. Bjorkman. And Mr. Bjorkman as well. All right, so before you, before we get into your presentation, um, housekeeping here. Uh, is it fair to say that um, take it away from him? He's in his court. <laughs> is that yours? No, it mine. was Paul's. Steve's. I know about. <laughs> Throwing your client under the bus. It's not mine. I've been in court no, all day. Actually, <laughs> all right. So, it, so. <laughs> Is it fair to say that this application is identical or substantially identical to the, the application that's been presented twice to um, the Special Permit Grading Authority within the last 17 years? Uh, tw uh, ten, 11 years? Uh, 12, 20 years. It is, it is the same in, that in those two in that it, we are requesting 
to reconstruct a similar two-family dwelling. Mm -hmm. However, the actual, the physical uh, setup of what is proposed is different. Okay. Is it fair, would you agree with me that if the board denies this application, that our denial will not, uh, that, that, that an appeal of any denial of this application will be foreclosed by race judicata in this case as well? I would uh, wholeheartedly disagree with that statement. And why is that? The laws changed, the plans changed, the project has changed, the law has changed, and the situation by law has changed. Okay. All right, so go ahead. And, and Peter, as you say, uh, again, uh, good evening. Uh, and this property, as you know, has had a long history uh, since the blizzards of 1978. Uh, and we're here tonight because over the years, the case law, the situate bylaw have changed and evolved to the point where tonight, despite previous attempts to rebuild this house, we feel very strongly that the board should approve this application. The case, how the case law has interpreted 40A section 6, as you know, is, has evolved over the years. And there's a chain of cases. Uh, the highlights are the Fitzsimmons, Goldhurst, Rockwood, Dialaway, Willard, Bransford, two cases, the Orkland versus Norwell, and then most recently the Gale decision. The chain of cases has created, as of 2010, an accepted framework in how towns may or may not regulate the alteration, reconstruction, extension, or structural change to a single or two-family residential structure. That framework provides that under the second exception clause of, of 40A, Section 6, as it concerns single or two-family residential structures, the permit granting authority must first identify the particular respect or respects in which the existing structure does not conform to the present bylaw, and then determine whether the proposed alteration, reconstruction, or extension, or structural change would intensify the existing nonconformity or result in new ones. If the answer to that question is that there is no proposed increase in the intensification <coughs> of the nonconformity, then the applicant should be entitled to the issuance of a building permit. Now, Situate, as you know, its practice has been to make both a finding uh, under Section 6 and grant a special permit. However, if the answer to that question is that there is a proposed increase in the nonconformity, then the board must state what that increase is and then determine whether the increase is substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing nonconformity. If the board decides that the increase is not substantially more detrimental, then the applicant is entitled to a finding and a special permit. In 2011, that evolution, that evolution of cases reached its culmination with the scale case, as we know. And, and as you said, it's an appeals court case that the SJC refused to take up, which means it's the law of the land. In Gale, the court ruled that this two-part framework that we just discussed does not include any application of the local bylaw or ordinance as an additional step when proceeding to the no substantial detriment finding under the second sentence of, of 40A6. That 40A6 standing stands alone, finding stands alone as sufficient to proceed with the project. It's crystal clear in our mind that even if a proposal creates new nonconformities, no variance is required, only a finding of no substantial detriment is required to enable the board to grant relief by way of a special permit. As the case law has been availing, evolving, so has the manner uh, of which nonconformities are defined and treated in the Citrus bylaw. Our bylaw has undergone changes over the years in response to, to the case law, in response to issues relating to the blizzard of 78, all dealing with the reality, the reality that about two thirds of the dwellings in Citrus are pre existing and nonconforming. The most recent change in the bylaw occurred in 2010, which was in response to, among other things, the two Bransford cases and the Orkland versus Norwell, both SJC decisions. Those decisions continue the evolution of the case law on nonconformities and both strongly confirm the two-part framework that we've, we've discussed. 
Indeed, we also went further by allowing a building inspector the authority to permit uh, a reconstruction, alteration, or extension of a single or two-family dwelling if it creates no nonconformities or the small type of alterations such as dormers, garages, and mudrooms. As a result of those cases, Citroen adopted Section 810.2 of, of its bylaw, which allows the reconstruction of a pre reconstruction of a pre-existing non-conforming single or two-family dwelling that under A, if the non-conformity is a lot is is as to lot area or frontage or both, and it meets all dimensional requirements, the building inspector can permit can issue a permit so long as any increase in gross floor area is less than 20%. The proposal that is in front of you meets 810.2a. Now, with your permission, I'd briefly like to go through section 800, the non-conforming uses and structures part of our bylaw, because it is clear that Citroen's revised bylaw is in complete agreement with the evolution of, of 48, of the interpretation of 48, section 6 by the courts. There are five subjects in 800. 810.1 states that any lawful structure or use <coughs> existing at the effective date of the bylaw, subject to the limitations of 48, section 6, may continue unless and until abandoned or not used for two years or more. By making this subsection subject to the limitations of 48, section 6, as Gail requires, this section cannot apply to the reconstruction of a pre-existing non-conforming single or two-family dwelling, which does not increase the non-conforming nature. It does, not, it does apply, say, to a commercial building or to a commercial use in a residential district, but it does not apply to single or two-family residential dwellings. Could you say that whole thing again? Because mm -hmm. I certainly didn't follow you. 810, 810 says that uh, any lawful structure or use existing at the date of the bylaw, which is, we agree is 1954, uh, subject to the limitations of 486, may continue unless that use or structure is abandoned or not year used for a period of two years or more. Do you want to? Do you want to? Do we want to talk about that now, or do we want to wait until after you're done and talk about it then? Um, Abandonment, non-use. It's up to you. It's, it's well, I mean, it's your roll. You're on a roll. I don't want to. I don't want to break <laughs> you. Uh, <laughs> Why don't you go ahead? Well, because uh, obviously, yeah, you know, first. Sure. Uh, again, our view is, since the bylaw, on its face, is uh, limited, subject to the limitations of 48 six, section six as Gail now requires, this section cannot apply to the reconstruction of a pre-existing, non-conforming, single or two-family dwelling, which does not increase the non-conforming nature. Okay, so the, the, the specific portion of 40A section six that you say says, proves that the does, this doesn't apply is, is what exactly? No, Gail says that a Local, I'll, I'll quote, I'll read right from Gail. I got it. So let me let glasses. me follow around. <laughs> okay, where are you at? With this I am on page, uh, the, the, the copy of Gail that I provided, I'm on page four out of six. Oh, you know what? I, I found that difficult to read. I printed my, I printed my own off of Google Scholar. Um, it's under, it's about in the middle of the decision. It's uh, about four paragraphs after. Uh, well, what page number? Because this gives a oh, page uh, a page of the decision? Yeah. Um, let's see. <clears throat> it's, it's right, it's, it's in the last two paragraphs of the decision. Four of six in our copy. But it's, it's, the last par it's the last couple of paragraphs of the actual decision. Sarah. Yep, okay. Starting with? Starting with, this two-part framework okay. does not include application of a local bylaw or ordinance as an additional step when proceeding to the no substantial detriment finding under the second sentence of 40, 48, section 6. 
That finding stands alone as sufficient to proceed with the proposed project. If the permit granting authority deems that no substantial detriment will result from the extension or alteration, alteration. This conclusion is in keeping with the special treatment explicitly afforded to single or two family residential structures under the statute. Thus, we find the board's finding in this case was all that was required and no variance under the ordinance was needed. Uh, the board um, made a, in, in, in Gale, the board made a, uh, a, a, a section six finding, a special permit and a variance. And uh, but, uh, to me, the, the important language obviously is that the finding under 40A section six stands alone as sufficient to proceed with the project. If, assuming a board determines no substantial detriment. Um, so, can I keep going? Okay. <laughs> uh, what, what we've discussed 8.10, 8, 8.10.2, 8, uh, uh, that, um, uh, where, where uh, excuse me, we have discussed 810.2, and I want you to please note that if a proposal uh, before a board does not fit within the criteria of section 810.2a or b, the bylaw provides for a process for an applicant to petition the board for 48 section 6 finding special slash special permit to allow the reconstruction. That would be of a case where if you're if you're going over 20% uh, gross floor area uh, or any other any other proposal uh, that does not meet the specific requirements of the of, of 810.2. 810.3 is uh, non-conforming structures other than a single or two-family dwelling. I think by its face, if you read if you read 810.3, it is, has nothing. To, it only deals with structures other than single or two-family dwellings. 820 is a change of non-conforming use. This section allows the board, by way of a 48 section six finding special permit, to allow non-conforming uses to be changed to a different use, not substantially different in character, or not more substantially detrimental to the neighborhood. This section is clearly a use section. An example of, of its proper use would be the applica an application which seen, uh, seeks to change a pre-existing non-conforming restaurant to a music venue located in a, in a residential district. 830, repair and restoration of non-conforming structures and uses. This section involves non-conforming structures and uses damaged by accidental causes. It allows repairs or reconstruction <coughs> if completed within four years. However, if an applicant uh, files a request within three years of the damage, the building ins inspector can extend the four year time period as long as the owner is diligently uh, moving forward with, with the work. This section has been rewritten uh, as situate, as recovered from, from the blizzard of uh, 78. Over the years, this section has been part of the discussion in building, <coughs> rebuilding both residential and non-residential structures, pre-existing non-conforming structures. It is clear, however, that Gale changes this. Gale dictates that this bylaw cannot be used to take the reconstruction of a single or two-family dwelling out of the two-part framework that is now the only criteria for the reconstruction, alteration, or expansion of a single or two-family pre-existing non-conforming dwelling. Did Gale have anything to do with the applic an application to restore a, a dwelling that had been uh, absent from the property for 10 years? No, it had to do with, a, it was a raise and reconstruct. Okay. So how is Gale even relevant to this situation? Gale is relevant because it says that... Gale, Gale dealt with a dwelling that was in existence at the time of the application. This dwelling was eliminated in 1980. Mm -hmm. The first application to, to re rebuild it was in 1991. Gale, however, says that a local bylaw cannot be used 
as an additional criteria in discussing the reconstruction of a single or two-family dwelling. Don't you think that Gail assumes in that language that the dwelling is in existence at the time of the application? No? No? No. Okay. I'll, I know you're going to litigate this because right. you'll just litigate, litigate this until the end, the, until the cows come home. But I, I, I mean, I, I don't even think this appeals court would go that far. Well, it remains to be seen what this board is going to do, and I'd like you to wait until the end to, uh, to, uh, okay, to decide because uh, we, I have more, more things to talk about here, okay. and I know the game is is running, but no, no, I'm, uh, but please don't, I don't, don't think that I'm. Uh, I know. All right. Okay. The last line of 830, I think, is very important and supports our belief that our bylaw has evolved to the state that if a single or two-family dwelling existed at the date of the bylaw, only 48 Section 6 can regulate its reconstruction, expansion, or alteration. Section 830 is the proper bylaw for the repair or reconstruction of structures other than a single or two-family <coughs> dwelling. And it, in it, Section 830 states that the protection of nonconformities is only afforded to buildings or uses in existence when the bylaw was first adopted. Our ZBA, I think, has been moving in this direction for years. While previous boards have used 830 and others to prevent the reconstruction of this house, more recent boards have recognized the right to reconstruct a single family dwelling more than four years after it was damaged, raised, or destroyed. For example, 19 Beaver Dam Road. In 2007, this board, the ZBA of Citroën, allowed the reconstruction of a pre existing non conforming single family dwelling at 19 Beaver Dam Road, which was destroyed by a gas explosion in 1982, 25 years after the actual damage and removal of the home, stating pursuant. To 486, the proposal to reconstruct was not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the previously existing non-conforming dwelling. At 167 Jericho Road, a house again destroyed by the blizzard of 78. Uh, in 1994, a special permit was granted to rebuild, 16 years after it ceased to exist. The special per this special permit was allowed to expire. In 1997, another special permit was granted to rebuild 167 Jericho Road, 19 years after it ceased to exist. More than two years later, in, in 2001, a building permit to reconstruct was granted to the then owner, Ed McLaughlin, and the permit was upheld by the Zoning Board of Appeals. This board has recently extended that permit again. 35 years after the original damage. That house has not yet been built, but there is a new foundation on the property, there's a new owner, and the property will soon be completely reconstructed. I bring these up for an example, as, for a reason. For over 30 years, Citroën has been trying to rebuild its housing stock since the blizzard of 78. For over 30 years, the courts have been trying to interpret 48, section six, and determine how to deal with nonconformities, but also how to protect its stated goal of special provisions for single and two-family residential structures. And for over 30 years, uh, the town has been amending its bylaw and uh, has been trying to do the same thing. <coughs> and for over 30 years, the ZBA has been trying to make sense of it all. Uh, the law, the case law, the bylaw, and the rights of property owners has been in the hands of the Board of Appeals to balance. However, with the advantage of the new case law and changes to our bylaw, we believe it's time to allow this home to be rebuilt. It is time because the case law has changed, our bylaw has changed, and I think I've shown uh, the law through the case law and our bylaw agree that this house should be rebuilt. I have four. I think you have. The, I have the four decisions right here uh, on this property over the last uh, uh, 22 years that Steve and I have been working on this property. 
I, know, I noticed that the, the, the cases that you didn't provide us for were the ones that dealt specifically with the denial of these applications. I have them right here for you. Well, you didn't, so we got them from you? Did we get them from you? We, I didn't get them at all. Mm -hmm. I got them in an email, attachments, uh, PDF attachments. I thought they came from Neil, but. Yeah, Neil and, Bo Neil and Laura Harbaugh both submitted yeah. stuff. I can send it to you guys via email. When? Today? Frank got it. Yeah, Peter weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. Everyone got it. A couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't see that email. Okay. One of those but cases. Certainly I would have read it. Yeah. One of those cases in, in 1994 uh, to rebuild a, a single family dwelling. Uh, Steve retained Peter Harrington, who is a member of the Joint Committee on Urban Affairs of the Massachusetts General Court, one of the authors of Chapter 40A, Section 6, when it was rewritten in 1975. Chapter 40A, Section 6 remained unchanged from that date. Um, I believe you have a copy in your file of that letter. In it, he states that the intent of the legislation adopted by the House and Senate by way of the second except clause was that there should be no time limitation or lot size limitation to reconstruct a pre-existing non-conforming single or two-family dwelling that was damaged or destroyed. He also states that the third paragraph of 48 section 6, that paragraph states that a bylaw, uh, a town bylaw may regulate non-conforming uses and structures abandoned or not used for a period of two years or more, which we also have in our bylaw, was intended to apply to structures that were built uh, violating setbacks. Mr. Harrington also stated uh, uh, that paragraph three of 40A section six was intended to prevent reconstruction after two years of that portion of the dwelling or structure that violates setbacks. I bring this up for two reasons. First, the application in front of you tonight meets all setbacks. Second, the case law has evolved into the new law, which is stated in Gale. The new law is more liberal than even Mr. Harrington was in 1994 or 1975. Mr. Harrington stated that after two years, no part of the home on Turner Road could be rebuilt that violates setbacks. But Gale goes further than that by stating that there can be no local bylaw or ordinance which can add an additional step beyond the two-step framework described in 48 section 6. Dale says that the property owner has the right to rebuild a single or two-family dwelling where and how it once existed, but that if you want to enlarge it or extend it, extend the nonconformities, you have to follow the two-step framework. That does not mean that pursuant to paragraph 3 of 40A6, the town can't regulate non-conforming uses of structures. It can, and it does. It cannot, however, apply that portion of the bylaw to interfere with the reconstruction of a single or two-family dwelling. That interpretation would be in direct conflict with Gale. The town recognized the special protection afforded to pre-existing non-conforming single two or two-family dwellings when adopted to new 810.2. It recognized that certain reconstructions may occur as a matter of right. Certain re minor extensions, alterations, which comply with setback, also may occur as a matter of right. And third, that further relief at the ZBA level uh, may, be had, uh, may be had with a finding under 48 section 6 and or a special permit uh, when an increase in gross floor area is more than 20% or when non-conformities are, are increased or new ones created. I'm just about done. Paul Mirabito is here to discuss with the board the floodplain special permit issues. It's important, I think, for the board to remember in that discussion that the bylaw was amended in that bylaw, the floodplain special permit bylaw, was amended in 1992. Uh, when it stated that a structure needed to be in existence on the date of that amendment. Again, I can't stress strongly enough that the portion of the bylaw that is in direct conflict with the Gale decision, that part, excuse me, that that part is in direct conflict with Gale as it interferes with the rights to reconstruct a single or two-family dwelling, uh, which is 
under Gale solely under the requirements of 48 section. All right, so you're saying that the appeals court in Gale intended to say that Gale rendered inapplicable any other provision of a local zoning bylaw that was independent of those uh, per, uh, regulating uh, non-conforming structures? Any local bylaw by that uh, goes beyond the two-part framework uh, in authority granted to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Regardless if it's in an overlay district? Pardon me? Regardless if there's an if overlay district? it involves district? a single or two-family dwelling, you cannot use a local bylaw to add an additional requirement other than the two-step framework uh, under 40A Section 6. To find that argument outlandish. Are you done? I'm done. Okay. All right. Question. Would you, would you agree that insofar as the, the issue of the abandonment or non-use that was determined by Judge Lombardi in 1994, 95, uh, would, would you agree with me that his determination, his fact determination that the uh, structure for use has been abandoned is binding upon you? No, I would not agree. Why? Because that was based under a local bylaw. Gail says you can't, you can't do it. You can't base uh, that decision on a, on a, on a local bylaw. <coughs> It's a fact, not a, 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 a conclusion of law based on the body. It's that the definition of abandonment um, is it's the, consistent with what's in 48. 48, section 6. Yeah. Section 6 uh, under the third paragraph, which allows bylaws to prevent or to, to regulate uh, uh, non conforming uses and structures abandoned or not used for a period of two years or more yeah. uh, cannot, under Gale, apply to a so single So you think that the appeals court's decision in Gale obliterates the, uh, the local zoning bylaws relating to abandonment and non-use as well? For single and two-family dwellings only, okay. yes, absolutely. So it obliterates abandonment, non-use, it obliterates floodplains, special permits, it obl obliterates any uh, 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 overlay district regulation at all? This project needs a floodplain special permit to proceed. All's here to address those issues. But you didn't ask for that in the application? Yes, we did. Yeah. Oh, is that your, any other relief the board finds necessary? Is that, is that your, uh... No, I think in, 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 um, in the, in the, in the public ad, I believe we it called for a, a special permit as well. I have floodplain special permit, excuse me. Section A, section 6. Okay, all right. Special permit. Okay. All right. But you would argue that following through with the fiction that the dwelling should still be locked, considered in existence, that we don't need to make the requirement of uh, not in fact subject to flood? The, the part of the bylaw that says <coughs> that in order to, uh, that requires that the building exist in 1992, that amendment, uh, initially the floodplain special, floodplain bylaw said it had to exist in 1972. Mm -hmm. and in 92, it was amended to say it had to exist in 92. Uh, we feel that similarly, the Gale decision requires that that portion of the bylaw, as it affects a single or two family dwelling, cannot be controlled. Okay. All right. Uh, Frank? I've got to say, I was struck by just reading all of this that this property was abandoned. I, I, I didn't read Yale the way you do with all 
respect. Um, and I think I'm right about the same trouble you have, Peter. I think that interpretation reads out the entirety of the zoning bylaw. Yeah, I mean, I, okay. I mean, I, that's my concern with it, Mike. I mean, your reading of Gale basically says the Gale case says, at least in res, re, relation to non conforming single or two family dwellings, no prior zoning bylaw applies. You must apply the Section 6 test, and that's all you can apply. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, I, I don't, I, I think the, even the appeals court would gasp. That, uh, that their their opinion is being interpreted so broadly. Let, pardon me? They wrote it. Let me let me just read one more time what, what Gail says. Well, hold on, hold on. We've read the case, Mike, but but you would agree that the Gale case was written to apply to the facts of the case that were before it, and that our and, and that the application of that decision, as in every other uh, 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 zoning case applies specifically to the facts that were found by the, by the, the uh, court that it's reviewing. Well, let me read one other part of Gale that I think counters what you just said, Pete, mm -hmm. respectfully. It says, in resolving this dispute, we are again called to interpret the difficulties and infectious language of the first see, two sections. Infelicitous. Infelicitous <laughs> sections of 48, section 6, as they pertain to single or two-family residential structures. And they go. They cite Fitzsimmons, the Supreme Court, in concurring, and Bransford, uh, concurring thereafter, and Bransford discussed this framework set out by the court in Fitzsimmons, Willard, uh, Goldhirsch versus McNair, Galloway versus Harbor. That framework provides that under the second except clause, the first paragraph of the statute, as concerns single or two-family residential structures, the permit granting authority must first identify the particular respect or respects in which the existing structure does not conform to the present law and then determine whether the proposed alteration or addition would intensify the existing nonconformities or result in new ones. If the answer to that question is negative, the applicant is entitled to the issuance of the special permit, Bransford quoting Willard. If the answer is in the affirmative, a finding of no substantial detriment under the second sentence is required, quoting from Willard. This two-part framework does not include application of a local bylaw or ordinance as an additional step when proceeding to the no substantial detriment finding under the second sentence. The finding stands alone as sufficient to proceed with the proposed project. Okay, and what that language tells me is that what the court is saying is that that the application of the local bylaw is limited to the the local bylaws that pertain to the regulation of non-conforming uses and structures not to abandonment not to floodplain special permit not to any other aspect of the zo local zoning bylaw except those provisions that apply to the regulation of non-conforming uses or structures. There is no abandonment statute in 48 section 6. There is only a local bylaw that talks about abandonment and not use. There is nothing in 48 section 6 that defines and regulates abandonment of non-conforming structures or uses. It leaves to the town the ability to regulate non-conforming structures and uses abandoned or not used for more than two years. However, Gail says... You're saying no longer. No longer can they do it for single or two-family dwellings. They can do it for entire situate harbor. They can do it for residential places where there are uh, businesses or a gas station or a restaurant but for single and two family dwellings there the law has for uh, 40 years given special protection to single and two family dwellings that has now evolved and I submit to you and I couldn't feel more strongly is now codified under Gale that if you have a single or two family structure you go by what 40a section 6 says the local bylaw cannot be used to uh, require anything other than a, a determination of 40, under 48 section 6 for the reconstruction expansion. 
alteration, structural change of a single or two family dwelling. Now, it, 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 oh, go ahead. Now, is there any uh, abandonment come into this at all for any building, any structure, any prior property in town that yes. had a house in it? If it was a single or two family house, no. If it so was, so if it was the, so if it was the uh, uh, quarter deck, yeah, but not not the, not a single or two family home. So there are other lots that have have been built on for 40, 50, 60 years and had a house there that burned down or whatever. You're saying that it can't be. Well, I think there were about 300 houses destroyed in, in the blizzard of '78. Uh, they've all been rebuilt except for this one and perhaps two others. Uh, I, I can tell you, I think that there is, that uh, if this board were to agree with us, uh, there is potentially a house on 6th Avenue that could make this a similar argument, and there is potentially a piece of property. Uh, uh, I can see Steve has researched this issue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 30 years worth. But I think, and there's also a potentially uh, a, a structure that could be rebuilt out close to the uh, to the um, to the uh, uh, the lighthouse. Other than that, every structure destroyed or damaged in the blizzard of '78 has been rebuilt in this town. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, and the one that's taken the longest so far is the one that this board has permitted, uh, 167 Jericho Road. The one that's taken about the same amount of time is one that the board has, this board has permitted on Beaver Dam Road. Um, I forgot the one on uh, Surfside, on the, the end of uh, yeah. <coughs> Mona. I missed that one. Next to the lower end. Glazer. I missed that one. Yeah, the end of Glazer. The end oh, of yeah, 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 that one. That one. But that was like 15, 10, 15 years ago? No, actually it was... Was it last? The, it was one of the, probably the first meeting I was sitting on. Anyway, okay. Right. Yes, it's been, it's your point, it's been done before. Uh, Ed? Um, before we ask, uh, we just want to get, get the board's com initial comments first and then find out what's all on your mind. As I understand the history of, of um, post 78 reconstruction, the bylaw to impose a time limit on permitting was intended basically to stop having uh, abandoned, more or less abandoned structures sitting there that needed to be done. I mean, it's like, look, it was basically, let's go. Come in, get the permit, let's move forward. Let's not leave these abandoned homes, these homes that are, are you know, not ready to be condemned, but they're not being lived in. Let's move this step, step this up. Because people didn't have the money, the inclination that was concerned about the ocean. I mean, 78 was a game changer. It made a lot of people think twice about what was going on. A lot has changed in terms of um, regulations for building near the waterfront, um, those properties that uh, were affected by 78. And I, I, I can actually um, understand how the court might have reached a conclusion as interpreted by Attorney Hayes from the standpoint of if this lot had never been built on, if this was an isolated lot, they could come in here and they could ask for a permit um, and they could get it and they would not be able to apply any zoning bylaw to it. They couldn't buy a setback. Um, no, the isolated lot uh, can be built on without any of the uh, later imposed uh, bylaw. Um, setbacks, et cetera, except I believe the height, well, there's one that we can because of state building code. Um, so if I look at this property as being um, a buildable, isolate, or an isolated lot, then it is buildable by nature because it pre-existed, it was non-conforming in size. And if nothing had ever been built on it, we'd be, we'd be signing off on this right off the bat, no question. We'd, yeah. have to, we'd have to make a determination that it's not, in fact, subject to flooding. Well, that's another. That's the other. That's another part we have to get to. But in terms of the the um, the time, the abandonment aspect, I question whether abandoning a single-family 
and two family views um, is possible because the existing non-conforming lots can be built in single and two family without um, reference to bylaws. Um, there seems to be a consistent um, desire to allow people to utilize the land for single family and two family homes. Abandonment um, of uses, for example, um, Paul Young's scrapyard, Class A junkyard, clearly has been abandoned. And, and clearly this, the case that the Attorney Hayes is making has nothing to do with abandonment of something like that. Um, a restaurant that is formally utilized. Um, I would wonder about something like um, the Women's Club. Um, Call them on the one in Milton as being, it's, it's not a single family, it's not a, it's, if it was on an undersized lot and they stopped using it as a women's club, could you turn it into a single or two family? Um, I wonder. I mean, there's, there is a case of it was abandoned, it was developed, and if it were undersized, what could you do with it? So I think abandonment has, has application, but um, historically it, it's misused um, in the single and two family residential unit. Um, so I, I, I'm not an attorney, but I can see the logic that the court might have applied to get to where um, the interpretation that the applicant's making. Um, solely single family and two family housing. Sarah? Okay. I have, I have to stick with my fellow, my brother attorneys here on this one. Gail, Gail applies to even, this, even what you read to us, an existing structure. We, we don't have an existing structure. We have a structure that hasn't existed since 1978, 35 years. And um, the bylaw, in effect in 1978, you know, gave gave the uh, gave the owner two years to um, build, and um, I see that ship has sailed. The you know you can't now go back. I think now you look at it, and you would have to look at it what the current zoning laws would say. And in fact, you know the case that that ended up. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the other two cases. I ended up with the one from. One of these I ended up that had yours. Oh, I got it from the town. And um, Judge Piper, he even says uh, he's got a legal inability to build a house given current zoning requirements. The, I don't see that that decision had, was ever appealed. And so I think you're kind of stuck with that. Um, I think it's... I, I think you're doing a fabulous job for your client. I don't think anybody could do as good. But I just don't see Gail getting you. Otherwise, you would, I think you take the whole zoning board of, a, you know, the whole zoning bylaws and throw them out with respect to single family homes except that one paragraph. And I just don't, I don't see it. Um, I think you've got a, a, an empty piece of property and it, it's, it, it is not dimensionally um, allow a structure on it. I don't see how we can ever allow a structure on it. I think it's a great argument. I think it's going to have to come from, you know, the appeals court or the SJC. But um, I think you're making way too broad uh, a valent, um, but um, not not common sense argument to extend Gale to this situation. I don't. I don't see how you get there. I don't see how you get by the fact that this, this is. Otherwise, you could. You know, if somebody comes in and says, there was a, you know, an Indian lodge on this property in 1684, that certainly predated zoning. So we should be able to rebuild something. How well, far back do you go? That, in that well, case, they could because well, it'd be sir, an isolated lot. They would legally be allowed to do it already. Here's how far back I think we go because people have been, have heard that, that argument before. Uh, is that uh, in 1992, I, uh, Mr. Arcan said to me, do you mean to say that if, if uh, 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 the Wampatuck tribe had a teepee on a non-conforming lot in the 1700s and that teepee is now gone, you, are you trying to tell me you can rebuild that? And I said, no, we can't rebuild that. 
but if a single family, single or two family residential structure existed the date situate adopted the Zoning Enabling Act, it has the right to exist and period. When, if it existed in 54, it has the right to exist. And if the lot existed in 54, it has the right to be built on. I, I almost promised I wasn't going to speak. Oh, I, well, that would be just that's so not going to happen. Okay, it's not going to happen. If the situate zoning bylaw had a clear definition in black and white of what an existing structure was, would you change your interpretation? I don't know. You're asking me to. I, I if don't know. If we had I a definition of an existing structure and I met that definition, would you agree I have an existing structure under the situate I'm zoning not bylaw? Gonna say, I'm not going to agree to anything the, in, the, in the abstract. I'd I, like to read the definition of an existing structure in the situate floodplain bylaw, section 470.4. .4. Definitions existing minute, buildings or structures shall mean those residential or non-residential buildings or structures existing in the floodplain and watershed protection district on the date of adoption of the floodplain watershed Prote protection district bylaw 1972 this house was existing in 1972 provided that the building or structure exists or has the right to exist and what we're saying is we have the right to exist because we have the right to reconstruct because there's no definition of reconstruct only being two years. This board in front of you, not you guys, but people before you, have allowed reconstructions of up to 25 or 30 years. Why is this any different than the ones that have been reconstructed? One was blown off the foundation in 1982. Last year, you just gave them a permit, or excuse me, not, not, not that one. 1982 was blown off. About five years ago, the board gave a permit to rebuild that as a reconstruction. Mr. Hayes represented the guy that came in. It was rebuilt not as a new dwelling, as a reconstruction over 25 years after it was blown off the foundation and ceased to exist. The structure on Jericho Road that Mr. McLaughlin ended up selling, but that structure was damaged in 1978. I owned the building next door. Is this okay? the same testimony that your lawyer gave for half an hour ago? Not really. Yes, okay. it is. It is. So don't repeat what, what, what Mike has already said. What, what I'm going to is what constitutes a reconstruction and what constitutes new construction. The history of this board is that it does not become new construction if it goes beyond the two years. And there's a number of decisions that this board has made that says that. In Gale, it doesn't say that the reconstruction is limited to a two-year time frame. It says any reconstruction alteration or extension cannot be regulated by a local bylaw. It has to be done under 40A Section 6. That's all. Were any of these that you cited, and I sort of remember Beaver Dam, but I don't remember the details, on undersized lots? Yeah, they're all non-conforming. Uh, are they on undersized lots? What, what would the difference be? The, the lot area. But, but what would the difference be? Our bylaw now says if I'm on an undersized lot, if I'm not increasing the non-conforming nature, I'm entitled to a building permit. I am not increasing the non-conforming nature. In fact, my increase is less than 20%, and I have also decreased the footprint of the building to make it meet all the setbacks. What was the footprint of the building? You haven't showed us one piece of evidence that tells what the footprint of the building was. Right here. Right here. We haven't? We I provided haven't it for you in the information a month ago. And, and that's part of Paul's, that is part of Paul's presentation as well. And this was as when, as of when? It says it's a that's the building that was pre-existing and the building that is proposed. And that's the percentage of increase in the square footage. And it's the, the, it's the percentage of decrease in the footprint. This was designed to make sure that we met the, portion, the new portion of the bylaw that says that we have a right to a building permit. Hmm. Do you have the old assessor's card? This uh, was, was, with the file. was with the file. It is okay. Yeah. Although the only one I have has is undeveloped land. There is no picture on it. Is the house crossed off? No, the the, the assessor's so, card that you gave. Oh, the old assessor's card package package is, is the one that indicates you're the owner. When did this property turn into buildable property? You you, you suggest? Uh, probably eight, uh, maybe around the 1900s. No, 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 no. I mean, with respect to for you in in your case, when when did this turn from undevelopable lot into a lot that you sh you you're entitled to build on? 
the claim is that it's May 11, 2011. Is that yeah, could have been. Could have been. If you wanted, if you wanted to determine 2nd, that, the, the new law in Gale makes it buildable. I've taken many lots in this town that are listed as unbuildable and made them buildable. You sure have. S some of them have taken me 15 years to do. I did one on Bates Lane that Neil Duggan disagreed with me for years and years and years. Once he had all the information that he needed from me, the building permit issued. There's now a house on that on that lot. I wish Neil was in the room right now. I hope you're watching on TV, Neil. I believe that at this point in time, if Neil read this stuff, he would agree with me. I'm sorry he's not here. I, and I'm really sorry he's not here, too. You're still paying taxes as an so, unbuilt up a lot. Though, so right? is it, um, so I don't want to get into the taxes on the lot because that's <laughs> got nothing to do with is it. Is it your position that <coughs> 470.9 doesn't apply, that you don't need to meet the test? Or, uh, and if, if it did apply, that you would only have to meet that portion of it that applies to existing structures? Correct. Correct. It's not new construction. In other words, the board first has to determine if this is new construction or reconstruction. I think we've provided the evidence to show that a reconstruction, this can be classified as a reconstruction, and that there is a history of older reconstructions in this town that have gone well beyond the two or the four year time frames that are certainly in the bylaw. Okay. Is there anyone uh, in the audience yeah. that, uh, the that wants to be heard on oh. this application? Or is everybody here for the cell tower thing? Does somebody want to be heard on this application? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Somebody just took the uh, Pete Menick, 140 Trinner Road, Kitty Corner across the street. Um, it would be, I guess I have two positions, or two points. One, I think that uh, Mr. Hayes and Mr. Bjorklund are, are overreaching on their Gale decision, uh, their Gale uh, opinion, and that um, they're trying to apply a case that this doesn't apply to. They're, they're trying to wipe out 30 some odd years, if, if not even longer, of town regulation um, with one misapplied court case. Um, second, and I don't know if we want to get into the floodplain part of this um, at this point, <coughs> but as I pointed out in 2003, I think, and can point out again too, that uh, this lot definitely floods. Uh, I can provide picture and video, it's pretty dramatic. Um, I don't know what it is specifically about this lot and the ocean front in front of it, but um, the water comes right over that seawall, higher than almost any place I've seen, and right down between my house and uh, my neighbors. Pretty dramatically. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? I saw another hand. Yes, sir? Yeah. Uh, Edward McCaffrey, I'm uh, directly across uh, 138 Turner Road, directly across from uh, the lot in question here. I, uh, just before I say anything, really, I just would request that if you're considering this proposal here, I would like an opportunity to at least read a copy of the transcript of all the information that Mr. Hayes and Mr. Borkman put forward today in order to, to be able to maybe rebut this. Because I myself have been doing this, with, well, been battling this for 30 years, along with Mr. Borkman, and I did prior to coming here, I had a couple of attorneys take a look at this decision or a couple of decisions that have already been formed, one of them more specifically the Superior Court from the county decision that was once rendered back 20 years ago, exactly 1993. And uh, I was pretty much, uh, it was confirmed by these other attorneys, one who was very local here and very familiar with this venue here in Situate, uh, confirmed to me that there were really no changes in any law that would affect what has already taken place over the years. In other words, there's nothing that Mr. Borkman should be able to present, unexpectedly, this evening that should change the decisions that have already been rendered some 20 years ago and 25 years ago, 10 years ago, etc. Um, so I do wish that I get an opportunity to present an argument if it's to go forward. Until I do, I was here when we discussed the TP, and that was out here. As big a joke as it is, I was almost going to raise that. I've been here when we discussed what's construction versus new construction versus reconstruction. I've been here and, and I've listened to the interpretation just like you would listen to the interpretation of Gail. You know, Mr. Hayes and Mr. Borkland have always presented a very wild 
you know, use a very wild imagination in their interpretation of a number of different court cases, a number of different uh, laws, state laws, bylaws, etc. And that's why I do uh, respectfully request an opportunity to at least rebut this. Uh, no disrespect to the board, and I'm sure you're going to consider what they've had to say. But a lot of this has all been rehashed over the years, what Mr. Borkin was just raising subsequent to Mr. Hayes' uh, presentation. It's been up and down these decisions, and if we go back into the file, which is probably that thick, I think you'll find that they've already been answered. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, Nicole, is there is there any um, estimate for when Neil will be back at work? Maybe like another two weeks, but he doesn't know. He has to wait for the doctor to tell him. Yeah. Two, three weeks. You're that confident in Neil's uh, opinion on this? I think I am. Well, I mean, I you know, uh, you, you continue, you go forward on this, you know, and finish your presentation, get a decision tonight. Um, uh, I, I don't think you're going to like it, but uh, well, again, if you'd like to have Neil weigh in on this, I don't have a problem waiting to have Neil weigh in on it, as long as he can read all the information. I don't know whether Nicole I, gave I, him a package or I think not. I'll probably be back by the next meeting. Yeah. Well, next meeting's only next week, right? Well, the July. July. Meeting. At the July the meeting. Next, the next week's meeting. Well, that's what I mean. It wasn't the next meeting's the antenna meeting, and that's he won't be back It'll for be that. July 18th. Yeah, I have no problem if the board wants to further research the information that we've well, given you because it's a it's a lot of information it's tonight. Lot, I mean, bear in mind. So, if you wait till July 20th, you get a new member. And you get Neil's opinion. So I won't be here in July. It, it, it's up or down on the new law. And that's um, all. well, yeah, I mean that's that's pretty much. I, I, I agree with that. I, I don't. You know the for, f from my perspective, there is a factual issue about whether or not um, the determination of abandonment as a matter of law is an issue preclusion to you on appeal of. <coughs> of an adverse decision and, uh, on, on this basis. If, if our decision, this board were to deny tonight based in whole or in part on the fact that we determined that the, the, uh, the structure was abandoned or uh, non-use and, and so uh, is not entitled to non-conforming structure status, um, there is the issue that you would need to deal with on the factual basis whether or not you're precluded from arguing that that's incorrect, that's an incorrect fact because it's already been determined. Now, and, and you know, there's a, the corollary legal issue as to whether or not the change in, in that Gale, as a matter of law, changes how that fact determination is made. Right? Mm -hmm. And the other is obviously the the scope of the the Gale decision. They're both, you know, uh, pretty big issues and and. Um, you know, if um, uh, we, uh, the board might decide that this is an important enough issue to ask town council for, for its opinion. Um, I mean, town council. I think the more people we get, the better. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't think that the town, you know, we've, you've, town has already paid to defend itself three times uh, or four. Um, uh, and it doesn't make any sense to, to do that again if, if the council that's going to defend it is, you know, thinks it's not a good idea. So uh, if, uh, if, if, you, if that's your preference, um, you can come back in July. Neil will be here, and, the, you know, we can uh, talk about whether uh, it's – we can ask Patricia if um, she'll authorize town council to, uh, to review the application. Um, do you want to hear from Paul tonight on the floodplain issue? It's your application. I, you know, bear, bear this in mind. The, well, actually, a new, new person comes on anyway. Um, he's not going to be able to vote. Well, we have the voting members anyway. Your, your voting members are here, so if you want to proceed with Paul. No, I, I don't want to keep anybody any longer, um, only because the floodplain issue is going to be secondary to obviously the reconstruction. Right. I, I think in, in a nutshell what's going to happen is 
this structure is going to be built on pilings. It's going to meet the requirements of the floodplain. We're not going to be subject to, or we're going to show that we're not going to be subject to the, um, the one that was at Doherty, where we have to show that it's not subject to flooding. This is going to come in more under what would be a substantial improvement to an existing structure. So I think we can meet those requirements. And I don't believe that it's going to be a problem under the floodplain special permit. But what I'd like to try to remind the board is that the information that Mike gave you tonight gives this board the authority to be able to help not only myself, but there are other people in town that I know you're aware of that have gone beyond that time frame. There's a home on, I think it's Holly Road, that burned about six years ago. They have not applied for permits yet. <coughs> this would also, your interpretation of this, the way that we see it, would give you the ability to grant them relief to build that house again. There's a house that burned on 7th Avenue. They're very close to running out of their three-year time frame. If they run out of the three-year time frame, they're not going to be able to rebuild their house again. What we've given you for information, and the Gale case, while it sounds like it's this big paramount thing, okay, what Gale says to me is if I have a house, I can always have that house. Nobody can take it away. Okay, I got to keep what was there. Okay, I can't make it bigger or I have to ask you special permission. But if I only want to keep what I had, I have a right to do that under Gale. That's what Gale says to me. So all the other stuff doesn't really matter. If the house was on the lot, then the house has the right to be on the lot. You just can't take that house away. Your abandonment, Peter, if you go away on vacation for two years and shut your water and gas off, I can prove that you haven't used your house for residential purposes. I appealed probably four permits of people who did not use their house for residential purposes for four years. It got to the point where there were women crying in the back of the room because the old zoning board agreed with me. And I said, I withdraw my application because I don't want to take their houses away. It's stupid. And Mrs. Downs on Lighthouse Road was one of them. Okay? The board probably would have taken the house away and not let her rebuild. Okay? That's not my intent. My intent is to protect the people's houses in situ. And I've, you know I've been at this for 30 years. And I think now we've got all the information we need for you to have an interpretation that says that house has a right to go back up, provided it's not more nonconforming than the house that was there. And that's all we're asking for. Beverly McCafferty, 138 Turner Road. You just had an incident uh, last year down in Humrock where the houses are so close together there. This has not been considered. These are old cottages. They were rebuilt, made open uh, year-round homes, and they are so close together, they are a fa higher fire hazard. One spark, you're going to have more than three houses going at one time. Thank you. If, if, okay, I could, if I could, through Peter, that's exactly why we're meeting the setbacks, because my lot will conform to those requirements. Do you want to continue? We'll continue. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, motion to continue until July 20th? 18th. 18th? So moved. <coughs> All those in favor? Uh, okay. The board is going to inquire as to uh, uh, the town administrator as far as town council weighing in. Yes. And uh, tomorrow morning. Do you do you need anything else from from us at this point? Uh, I don't. I uh, I don't think we need anything. We would ask for anything more than you've already given us. Uh, if town council. Um, Yes. We'll, 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 we'll cooperate with the town council and anything we need, we're happy to get them. If you, do you have a little memo? I mean, you look like you're doing some reading on on why this abandonment issue. I have a narrative that yeah. that I, I read tonight. Certainly. Can you turn that into like a little memo with some citations and you're willing oh, to share? Come it? on, Sarah. I'd like to. No, I mean, <laughs> I just like to <coughs> read it. I can give you. I give mean, her the, give I can, the, give we can the give file. you this, and I can at some point in the near future, I will scan and email those nine cases uh, and get those to you, certainly. Uh, Be helpful. And I can I can get that those to, to everybody, or I can get them, <coughs> give them to Nicole and she can forward them to, to everybody. But I'll, I'll the, th that evolution of cases uh, from Fitzsimmons forward, I, I will scan and, uh, and send to the board that she can send to you. And, and uh, you can have this and I can 
send that as well to to, uh, to, to Sarah. And, yeah. and I'm, I'll make sure Nicole gets that. As well as if one of the neighbors wants to give us an email address, well, I'd be glad to send it to them as well. Well, you know what? Just uh, make sure that Nicole has it in uh, a PDF. Okay. And, uh, and and uh, they can contact yeah. her. And we appreciate the time and and, and, <coughs> and listening to this uh, application and this. It's, it's you got to admit it is interesting it's area of the law yes, that has is. been people have been trying to figure out for forty years. Infelicitous is a, is <laughs> a uh, charitable word. And, and I'm I'm glad at least the Gale decision has gotten clearly through to this board that variances are not required to create new non-conformity. Well, we, I don't know, think the, we've ever granted Mrs. Them. Donnelly, uh, the, the Donnellys are very happy. That's, that's how I <laughs> found you know the what? case, was helping the Donnellys. You know, the, 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 the people we owe an apology, I don't know, it was before, not, it was before the decision, but we ought to get a hold of those people in the, in the West End who we uh, sadly sent out of here because they wanted a modest increase in their, remember the front porch? They wanted to come out closer to the house uh, to the road and we we told them we can't do that and we were wrong I mean you know and and they they never came back they never they didn't uh, they didn't try to yeah. hopefully, hopefully they're watching this on TV and they and they'll come back <coughs> I do this in a lot of different towns and most zoning board of appeals have issues with the way they interpret 40a section 6 all right well let's uh, let, let, let's get okay. you out of here so that okay. we can uh, catch the second period right. <coughs> Maybe um, third. The, the motion has been made to continue until july 18th or second we're seconded by ed seconded by ed all those in favor aye, aye. Right. steve july 18th all right now Thanks. last item on the agenda is a discussion issue for the board only this is not a public hearing uh, we're not taking any public uh, input um, the uh, uh, when we closed the uh, first segment of the hearing on AT&T um, Uh, we had anticipated uh, uh, contacting uh, the consultant that we had retained uh, in 2010 and uh, after the hearing I discovered that unfortunately uh, Mark Hutchins passed away in October That's too bad. Uh, and uh, so That's good. actually I, I guess we did know that at the hearing we did know okay so I, I, I had um, the number of uh, wireless consultants that uh, uh, that, that uh, do this kind of work is very very short and, uh, and thin, and uh, so uh, I was all set to uh, uh, identify a consultant, and um, uh, I decided that we couldn't do what we needed to do within the time frame that um, uh, we had anticipated. So well, we put this on the agenda tonight to discuss a consulting agreement with uh, Ivan uh, Pagasic of IDK Communications. The form of the proposed consulting agreement is essentially identical to the consulting agreement that was executed uh, between the town and Mr. Hutchins um, in 2010. Uh, with the exception that we have added uh, added to the uh, scope of the application review, uh, not supplanted new uh, review, but added to uh, this uh, his review of Hutchins's work, uh, in addition to all the technical information and coverage analysis for existing and proposed sites provided by the applicant today. So essentially, uh, what this proposed agreement would do would be to ask Mr. Pagasic to review Mr. Hutchinson's report, review the technical information and coverage analysis for existing proposed sites provided by the applicant today, any new information from the applicant uh, that is different than that submit submitted to uh, Mr. Hutchins, uh, and also to analyze the feasibility of alternative technologies uh, that might be available to provide equivalent coverage uh, and provide us a, a, a report. 
I have spoken to uh, Mr. Pagasik uh, on the telephone. Uh, he is able to undertake the assignment uh, and to, to uh, produce his work and provide a report and to be present for um, the next hearing in, the, not the next hearing, the hearing, a, uh, a hearing on July 18th. Um, there, so the idea would be uh, that we would, that uh, at and would agree to continue the application from the June 20th date to July 18th. Do we want to have both these applicant applications on the same night of the Joe Clinton? Yeah, that's not a problem. Um, uh, easy for you to say. Well, it's <laughs> easy for me to say. <laughs> um, uh, that at and would request a continuance from June 20th. So, uh, because there's, uh, this is really the, 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 uh, the, the bulk of it. Um, uh, from from their perspective, they would ask that it be continued to, from June 20th, uh, and that the board would get this report sufficiently advance of July 18th to have an opportunity to to review it. That the public would have an opportunity to review it, and uh, AT&T would have an opportunity to review it. So that July 18th date would be principally to focus on the independent consultants report. So that's my report to you. Will we have that prior to the 18th? The report? Yes. The uh, yeah. The, the idea is that uh, the idea is he said I can't have it by the by by June 20th. All right, so um, we'll, we'll have a little yeah, bit of time. With so. with your permission, um, I would forward this agreement to him tomorrow morning. Um, get him, and essentially he would be able to begin his um, his work um, by Monday. And um, he said he only needs a couple of weeks to do it, so the report should be able to you know, be generated by July fourth and give everybody a couple of weeks. Will that will that need to be agreed upon by us or the uh, town administrator? Or you know, is it clear. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, because I don't, I don't remember being directly involved in in um, in how Mr. Hutchins uh, was retained initially. But since the applicant is paying the fee uh, for the consultant, what usually happens is, as a pro forma matter, the town administrator uh, uh, authorizes the well, authorizes or executes this. The applicant writes a check. The check goes into uh, an escrow account with the town uh, treasurer's office, mm -hmm. um, and the uh, and the consultant proceeds. There's no appropriation requirement or anything like that. I do believe the board has to vote to to, to hire. Yes, we do. Yeah, that's why we're that's why we're here. Make sure you do the vote. Uh, any? Does anybody have any questions on it? Um, is this somebody you've worked with before? Um, I have not worked with uh, this fellow before, um, but um, I've seen his work. Um, I've seen his um, uh, testimony in, in uh, other cases. He's represented, you know, dozens of other communities in Massachusetts and in, uh, in New England. Um, the one thing I can say about about him, as with Mr. Hutchins, is um, his opinions have never been rejected by a federal court, which uh, which is I think one of the things that gives me some confidence in uh, in him. I unfortunately, you know, Mr. Hutchins had a, had a he's the only member of Mensa that I've ever met. He was imp he was most impressive. He was unbelievable. Yeah, he was very good. Mr. Chair, can I ask a quick question? You may ask a question. Uh, no statements, I promise. Um, as far as this consultant's work, is this retroactive to the information that has already been presented and entered entered into testimony by AT and T? Yes, he, they, the the consultant will work from the coverage maps. 
the information that's included in all of uh, that's already been presented to the, the he will get a copy of the record. Uh, he will also uh, because there is there is uh, technical data that underlies the maps that are created, the coverage map. So uh, when he's retained, he will have direct contact with the engineer at AT and T who will provide him with a bunch of data that is the data that upon which those coverage plots were, were made. And then he independently runs that data on his own models to affirm that the conclusions that were reached are consistent with what he finds. Uh, and that would be the case for this and for the other alternative sites as well. well for me, I just want to thank you for considering this and um, making this happen. It, it will be nice to have some balance. Thanks a lot. Thank you for considering. Pleasure. Yes? Um, Jen, I took her through 97 Tilden Road. At the last meeting, um, Tr she, yeah, Tracy had said that she gets, she's on Cairo Circle, and that she does get coverage and that doesn't have drop calls and all. And um, the AT&T radio engineer said, well, you're not, you're, that's okay for you, but we're losing the business because your call is being sent over to Verizon. And then he was kind of hushed up a little bit. Okay, so I, this, is why, this, is, uh, this, this is why this is why you know, why I would, didn't want to ask, we're not going to ask and answer questions uh, No, I just tonight. wonder if that could be, is that part of what this person is going to be Mr. Pegasic, yes, he's yeah. certainly well qualified to address those questions and will. <clears throat> Uh, he'll, he'll address any of those questions that you have for him, but I'd rather you ask him directly. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. In, Stephen Tooker, 397 Tilden Road. In exploring alternative technologies, is he apt to con contact um, Wellesley and their radio frequency engineers who um, apparently developed a DAS system there? Is, is that I, one of the things I, he's apt to do? Uh, Mr. Pagasic is the expert, and what he does to to examine the alternative technologies is uh, is up to him. If you if if you're, you know, another question you can ask him when he when he's here on the twentieth on the eighteenth is whether he did do such, whether he contacted. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yes. Tracy Shepard, thirty-four cars. Should we expect then that next week's meeting would be, you know, insubstantial? Um, non-existent. Non-existent. <laughs> yeah. non Do we have to show up to cancel it? <laughs> Do we? Yeah. Do we? Well, no, but Mr. Mr. Perry, Perry yeah. will, uh, by letter, request that uh, that it be continued. He may change his mind, decide that he wants to have the real estate people come, you know, next week. But his indication was, yeah, if is. if we're hiring the consultant. As a matter of fact, to, to, you know, just to, to, in all uh, uh, for full disclosure, he was the one that suggested that Mr. Pagasic not be asked to rush a report to June and, and show up in June, and said oh, we have no problem with continuing this into July to give everybody time to, you know, get the report, read the report, et cetera. So um, that was volunteered by AT and T. Okay, so does anybody have any questions on the consulting agreement, the scope of it, et cetera? All of the time, et cetera, is blank, but um, you know what he's charging and how much time he's going to take is really not our concern because AT and T's paying paying the tab. We will we engage the uh, consultant for a peer review of the scope of the proposal as outlined in our discussion? Okay. Great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Anything else? Move to adjourn? Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks.